right, good evening, everybody. And welcome to Vital Voices. Uh, as some of you may know, Vital Voices serves as a forum to bring, the UHD, to bring to the UHD community scholars and practitioners who work on issues vital to the functioning of our democracy. Uh, our guests speak from their professional experiences and uh, about their work and how it impacts society. Uh, we purpose to showcase individuals whose work is interdisciplinary, touching upon the fields of social work, criminal justice, and urban education. Uh, over the years, we have uh, explored subjects such as addiction, youth in the criminal justice system, homelessness, reducing recidivism, the graying of America, that was my favorite, um, how social work impacts immigration, school violence, tackling the silent epidemic of childhood grief and trauma, bail reform, cognitive dissonance, voting justice, modern day slavery, just to name a few. Next uh, up, this, we will have a presentation by our own Gator Advisory Board, and those are students who represent all of the disciplines here in the College of Public Service. And they're gonna do a presentation on the intersection of the fields of social work, criminal justice, and urban education, uh, with guests in those fields who are boots on the ground. Um, you know, they wanna explore and to inform our students of what is it really like to work in those fields today. Um, finally, this year, we're going to end with a presentation called From Functional Literacy to Financial Literacy with uh, our special guest, we hope, Congresswoman Sylvia Garcia. We're going to explore how both functional literacy and financial literacy contribute to the economic success in society. Uh, the discussion will explore the state of financial literacy, not only in Texas, but nationally as well, and what that means for us as individuals and us as a society. Um, last year... We, we did a lot of firsts this year. Earlier this year, we had a, um, a three-day symposium on sex trafficking. Uh, that was a first in that it was a three-day event. And then we, it was also a first because it was completely student-led. And it was extremely well done. Um, and last year, we had the pleasure of having Drs. Uh, Ruth uh, Lopez and Rhoda Fr uh, Freelon from U of H coming to do a presentation here on um, engaging families and communities in the education process. And the response was so positive, but beyond positive. It was just, it was encouraging. There was a movement going on that we had to repeat it. We had to do something else. And so that's what we're doing tonight. We're doing something else. And that's what we're doing tomorrow. And that's why we asked Dr. Ishimaru to come and speak to us. So I, uh, she's going to talk to us about her groundbreaking research in the field. And uh, I am going to introduce you now someone who has uh, spearheaded, along with Drs. Uh, Burnett Sanchez, uh, Freelon and Lopez, Dr. Burks, who has uh, really spearheaded this whole event to get Dr. Ishimaru to come visit us, visit us from the University of Washington. So without further ado, Dr. Burks. Thank you, Mr. Villano, and thank you everyone for joining us tonight. We've got students in the back, way to go, MAT 6380. <laughs> thank you all for joining us online, and thank you for all of our colleagues here in the college for joining us as well. And so thank you for that introduction, introduction Mr. Villano. And this process has certainly uh, been a wonderful experience. And so as Mr. Villano mentioned, um, as we had Drs. Uh, Ruth Lopez and Dr. Rhoda Freelon, uh, myself and Drs. Burnett Sanchez, uh, we were in the chat really uh, passionate about this topic. So I'm excited that Mr. Villano um, invited us to join him on this adventure. I'm not sure that he knew what he was signing up for. <laughs> and so uh, tonight we'll have this event, but also tomorrow we're having a mini conference. And so oftentimes we get to enjoy these sorts of presentations, but we want the application of this knowledge to reach as far as we can. And so we have created a mini conference tomorrow to be in community with school districts and also educational organizations to further this work. And so I think what Mr. Villano saw in the chat uh, when we had Drs. Ruth Lopez and Rhoda Freelon join us is this sense of urgency to really um, think about how we partner with families in our education systems. And one of the things I was able to experience during the pandemic, um, I was working on a grant with the University of Arkansas, and I really saw a shift in our profession to work with families in ways that we have not done before. 
And so as we are continuing and moving forward in the education field and what we are working on, I um, hope that we'll bring that sense of urgency in working with families and to bring that new knowledge with us and moving forward. And I hope that we can all work together uh, towards social justice in our education systems. And so that brought me to, um, as we were discussing, and I got to work with and collaborate with Dr. Burnett Sanchez. Uh, she was our uh, chair for our department. And so being able to work with her and to see her passion about this project has certainly brought a lot of value to me in my work as an early career scholar. But also Drs. Uh, Rhoda Freelon and Dr. Ruth Lopez, their passion and the work that they do at the University of Houston has certainly added uh, these unique perspectives that I've been able to listen to and to grow from. So I'm excited about these events that we have uh, today and tomorrow and to really think about furthering this idea of social justice through uh, collaboration uh, with families. And so as we were discussing, one of the things we really uh, kept coming back to is Dr. Ishimaru's work. And so in the original presentation, that was something that we shared was, hey, is anyone teaching courses around uh, Dr. Ishimaru's text? And what could that look like? And so that's where kind of the discussion came. And so that's how um, the idea of Dr. Ishimaru coming and speaking with us today and being here um, has been a goal of ours. And so we're excited uh, to be able to have that happen to, and come to fruition. And so tonight is um, an exciting kind of kickoff for these two day events. And so thank you again for joining us tonight and hopefully tomorrow as well. And a big thank you to Dr. Ishimaru for joining us and answering that call uh, to be here with us. So I'm gonna pass it over to Dr. Rhoda Freelon and she'll be introducing Dr. Ishimaru and her work. So I know her, but I have to have my notes because her um, accolades are so long. <laughs> and she just blushed when I said that. But um, I'm honored to introduce to all of you Dr. Ann Ishimaru. Um, Dr. Ishimaru is a professor at the University of Washington. She's an education researcher, a former K-12 educator, and a mother. I wanted to bring all her identities to the table because they inform the, and, and makes, make her really passionate about the work that she does. Um, and she's joining us today um, to share insights from um, a lot of her work, which she has deep expertise, deep expertise across a number of research projects where she has worked in conjunction with families, community members, educators, school and district leaders to, um, to move us forward as practitioners and as education scholars in the area of family and community leadership. So, um, but let me tell you a little bit about her background. She has received um, her master's degree in curriculum and teacher education from Stanford University. And she also received a second master's degree in education policy and management, as well as her doctorate in education from Harvard University. Um, her scholarship really focuses on the intersection of leadership, school, community relationships, and educational equity. I know as um, an, a young scholar, um, I met her at, at when I was a graduate student at American Education Research Association, and, and her work has really shaped my teaching, um, my own research agenda in re really ways that I don't know if she really knows. I mean, I've told her this, but I don't know if she really understands. Um, and her research pays particular attention to students, families, and communities who have been historically marginalized in the educational system. Um, it's just, I mean, I'm delighted to have her here. So she is a co-principal investigator for the Family Leadership Design Collaborative, some of which she'll speak on today, which is a national effort to recenter marginalized families in racial equity efforts in schools. Um, she also has a number of um, other research projects that she's juggling and managing that maybe she'll uh, provide some insights about. But I want to share, um, I ran into her in like 2017 at a conference in Denver, and we happened to be staying at the same hotel, and I, and I saw her in the lobby, and I said, can you um, let me know what you're working on these days? <laughs> I'm always curious to find out what she's working on. And she said, I'm writing a book. And I was like, that's cool, I can't wait to read it. And she's like, I can't wait to finish writing it. And so that's why we have her um, 
book with us now, and, and, and Dr. Lopez and I have sent a couple of our classes around her text, which is Just Schools, Building Equitable Collaborations with Families and Communities. So welcome, Dr. Ishimaru. Wow, what an introduction. Thank you, Dr. Freelon. <laughs> I'm blushing the whole time. Um, thank you so much for having me here today. I'm really honored um, to be able to, to talk with you, to engage with you, to share some of my work with you. Um, uh, Dr. Freeland mentioned uh, this book came out actually at the very top of the pandemic. And as those of you who are kind of following the news might know, that Seattle was actually the place where it first sort of began to, to percolate up. And so when my book came out, I thought, oh my gosh, this is like, you know, I can't imagine worse timing for a book to be released. Well then, what happened then after, you know, what, what like we go into the months and, and things start to develop, then all of a sudden all of our kids were out of school and they were in homes. Um, and so this conversation where I, I was telling um, Dr. Freeland on the way here, it used to be I used to have to kind of convince people that we should be talking about families. Um, and all of a sudden, the pandemic and the remote schooling made it something that made it so that we didn't, it wasn't a question of whether families and parents mattered or whether it was something we should be talking about, right? So, and then, then in 2020, in the summer of 2020, of course, there was, there was the killing of George Floyd and, and far too many, just, you know, the accumulation and the racial reckoning. And so then the, then the conversations about racial equity and racial justice coming together with those conversations about what's happening in education um, and what's what we're thinking about with families and communities really opened a, a kind of window for folks um, to be really engaged and really interested in having these kind of conversations. So um, much as I'm, um, it's, it's been really tragic um, and we are all carrying so much grief um, and heaviness around the things that have, have unfolded since the pandemic. One of the things that has happened though is that people are ready for a conversation they might not have been ready for earlier. Um, well, both broadly speaking, one of the things I wanted to start with is both broadly speaking as a settler myself, but also in terms of my work, I'm very indebted to uh, the indigenous knowledges and methodologies and understandings and worldviews um, in my own work. Um, and so I want to start with just acknowledging um, that the lands that we're here on um, and the peoples who have been here since time immemorial and continue to be here and who have futures um, as well. And oh, um, this is uh, just an image um, that a young person did um, in, that I found um, in a, a kind of a youth uh, summer program. Um, and so I also want to um, recognize the labor of Africans who were brought here by force and enslaved, um, who we owe not just gratitude to, but also a debt that we have yet to pay. Um, and I want to recognize as well the labor of immigrants, and those include uh, folks in my own family, who were so invested in their children's futures that they came to a new country. They labor on the land, they do their in-service work, they labor in other people's homes. Um, and so one of the things that I like to remind people about is when they're thinking about family engagement, how, might, how could there be a, a, a greater demonstration of family engagement than taking your family to a new country and doing all of that? So the last thing I want to just um, share is that, you know, we are in perilous times. Um, and I think sometimes when, um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about the, the challenges, I can, my faith can sometimes flag a little bit um, about where we're headed and, and what we're up to. And it really is helpful to me to think about um, this reminder from Linda to Y. Smith, who reminds us that, that families and communities um, have survived, have been learning, and they've even found ways to thrive despite incredibly challenging and hostile circumstances. So there's wisdom um, still that, that comes from histories and ancestors, and it's still present here today. She says, people, family, organizations, and marginalized communities struggle every day. It's a way of life that is necessary for survival, and when theorized and mobilized, can become a powerful strategy for transformation. 
So if you're familiar with my book, um, and you also heard it in Dr. Freeland's introduction, uh, you know that I argue that we should begin with families and communities. So usually in a kind of research presentation, I would launch in and start talking about the research. But I actually want to model that for a minute um, and share a, a simple practice that is something that you can do as well. Um, to, um, one of the things that I do sometimes is I ask people to introduce themselves to each other through an object that's important to them, their family or their community. So I'm gonna do that now. Um, up here, that is a picture of me hitting a very large drum. Um, it's made, a drum made out of a 60, or 55 or 60 um, gallon uh, barrel, wine barrel. Um, it was a drum that I helped build and it's called a taiko. Um, and so uh, taiko uh, originated in Japan, uh, but evolved into an Asian American art form. And it's big, as you can see. You can't hear it, but it's very loud. It's very joyful. Um, and it's the exact opposite of the stereotype of the quiet, passive, unassuming Asian woman. Right? So that was very intentional on my part. Um, and through Tycho, it was an opportunity also to learn about my family's history, my community's history. So I'm Japanese American. Um, during the 60s in the US, Tycho became a very important symbol um, of political voice, of, of cultural um, identity and pride. Um, and it became really important, especially in the, the reparations movement the, and a, a kind of form of resistance to get the government to acknowledge that it violated its own constitution when it incarcerated 120,000 Japanese Americans during World War II. And that included my family. My father was actually born in one of the incarceration camps. Um, and so, so Taiko was an opportunity for me to learn about those histories, to learn about resistance. Um, and this down below here is to, to sort of connect to a broader community. This Valerie Otani over here is, a, is somebody I met through Taiko who became a kind of auntie to me, a community auntie. She passed away a couple of years ago, sadly, but she did this beautiful public art piece. Um, and you can see all the, the little pieces up there on this tori gate are actually, they're metal and they make this beautiful little tinkling sound. But it's actually a reminder of the tags that people were given uh, with numbers on them when they were going to the camps, when they were sent to the camps. So um, as you heard, I went to um, Harvard for my graduate studies. Um, and so I spent 10 years as a professional taiko player and then decided to go back to school um, to um, take up graduate studies. So the first um, person, one of the first folks that I told, I decided to, um, I was a brand new naive graduate student. Um, and I told a highly respected male professor, a uh, white male professor, um, that I wanted to understand how families could be a part of educational change. Man, am I like heart beating now. I think about that moment. He gave me the most withering look. Um, and he's famous for those withering looks. And he dismissed me out of hand. He told me, the only thing that parents could do was support their kids at home, doing their homework, things like that. And you know what? That's been done. There's nothing there to study. Um, so the, it didn't quite square with my own experiences, though. Um, and at this point, I had gotten, um, I was no longer um, able to kind of um, accept the status quo and stay quiet. Um, and uh, so, I decided to start investigating and trying to find out, is, is that right? Is there really nothing there? And at the time, I didn't have all the theory and research that I have now, but um, you know, the, the, there was something that I already had a sense for, that there was insights, there was knowledge, there were understandings that marginalized voices, marginalized voices held, not only about in, inequities and oppression, but also about resistance and about more liberatory and just futures. So, I came to this work from learning from my own families and community. All right. So I'm going to talk a little bit about tonight. I'm going to spend a little time talking about equitable collaborations, which is kind of this framework that evolved out of some work I did. Um, and then I know because Dr. Lopez and Dr. Freeland talked a little bit about data and equitable collaborations, I thought I would kind of dig in there a little bit um, and, and give you some examples from my work about how we might think about expanding who engages with data, what we're thinking of as measures that matter, um, and, and how we're uh, working with data and to what ends. Um, and then I'm going to uh, share a little bit um, some of the more recent work um, that you heard about is um, something that Dr. Megan Bang and I have, have, have um, co-evolved with, uh, with a, a ton of partners in, in this network called Solidarity Driven Co-Design. And we'll talk a I'll talk a little bit about the theories of change that are coming out of that. 
All right. So after my talk with Dr. Harvard, um, I, said, I thought, OK, so now I better actually look at the research and figure out what the research says. OK. So um, we do know that families matter. We know from decades and decades of research that family engagement does make a difference in student academic outcomes. We even have outcomes like uh, from Mr. Tony, Dr. Tony Brake um, that uh, is correlating strong parent school ties to um, improvements in math and reading test scores. It's also correlated with all the things, all the academic outcomes. Uh, things like graduate, or sorry, start with start with like attendance. Even um, it, it correlates to things um, with grades, uh, uh, better discipline, um, more advanced course taking, graduation, college going, all of those kinds of things, right? Um, and then what I also started to realize that there was there was a small but important and crucial body of work that already existed. Um, about this notion that we might have to rethink a little bit about what we mean by family engagement. And um, this notion that those who are closest to the problem often have some key expertise. So this is Michelle Fine. She said, those who have been most systematically excluded, oppressed, or denied carry specifically revealing wisdom about the history, structure, consequences, and the fracture points in unjust social arrangement. So we have the situation where on the one hand we know it matters greatly, it's highly correlated with all these things that we might want in, um, in schooling outcomes. We, um, and we have scholars who are beginning to question and ask about what we mean by family engagement and then what the, but that we all already have a, a, an idea that there's some expertise there, right? So I wanted to, um, I started to talk to families of color and, and ask them about their experiences in schools. So um, I wanna actually, because I, I, I wanna interact a little bit with you all and I, hopefully maybe we can do the mic or something. Can I have a volunteer just read Mary? Is there a mic that someone? I went to the parent nights and events for the first year. Then afterwards, I just walked away. We were just getting talked at, and we were just there by ourselves. We couldn't talk to anybody else. I haven't gone to too much after that because I had other activities. Thank you. Can someone read Javier for me? Which, by the way, is translated. He said this in Spanish. But thank you. I want my children to succeed, but schools here are very different. We always feel we are outside the system. We go to, to the school and nobody speaks our language. And he went on to explain, actually, there is, they, they did sometimes use Google Translate, but then it often didn't actually still make sense. We talk with the teachers and they tell us what we should do. They tell us our children are not doing well compared to children who only speak English. But my three-year-old child speaks two languages and is learning English. We know when people are judging us. So take a minute and just chat with the person next to you. How are these parents experiencing school? They come from very different cultural groups, different kinds of schools. All right, so the folks online can't necessarily hear, so, but maybe we could just generate a couple of things and I'll, I'll, I'll say it back since the mic, it's a little awkward with the microphone. So how do, how do these families experience school? They feel like second class citizens. Okay, she said they feel like second class citizens. Like outsiders. Oh, okay, feel like outsiders. They feel kind of judged, like there's no support for them. Uh-huh, okay, feeling kind of judged, there isn't support. Anything else? Isolated. Okay, feeling isolated. I think they feel powerless. Oh, okay. Feeling powerless. And like what my partner said, he said marginalized. Hmm. Um, I think there's a common trend here is the fact that they, they don't feel like they can communicate in their language. Mm. They're, not, they're not connected to their language. Mm. And then Fatima, she's like, when I go in there, you know, my child is not praised for learning one word in English. They're praised. Other kids might be praised, and that's what they're singing. They're seeing you're giving me negative feedback about my child who does is actually does know two languages. And if you think about it, you know, I read an article where it says that the, if you're in a dual language school, 
who is most likely to get praised, the English kid who's learning a Spanish word, mm. or the Spanish kid or the Hispanic kid that's learning an English word, mm -hmm. right? Interesting. And usually, it depends also where you know the teacher is involved, right? Mm -hmm. Every stakeholder is involved. Okay. And you, and the way you speak is the way people are going to perceive you, and that's how parents are perceiving us. Mm -hmm. So, what are we communicating? Okay. All right, I'm not going to be able to re <laughs> repeat all of that, but but um, the gist of it, I mean, we don't have the microphone, so that's why I'm, why I'm doing this, just really talking about this um, idea of feeling marginalized and how language is very tied up in that, that um, that this, uh, that this um, Fatima um, is talking about what how other um, adults in the school are reacting to her child. And she's referencing a, a study about uh, what happens in dual language contexts and, and which children are getting um, support and praise for speaking uh, English um, or Spanish um, in that case. Yeah, I mean, this the Fatimas is really striking because you got a three-year-old who's about to be trilingual, right? <laughs> And she's being told that her child is not learning English as quickly as the English-only children, right? Thank you. Exactly. So, you know, the, these experiences of marginalization are strikingly common in, in, for particular families who are racially minoritized. It's in almost a norm in some ways. But here's the thing. When we think about the complexities of the inequities in our schools, we have histories of deep racial disparities. We have other intersectional um, uh, experiences of oppression. We have an increasingly diverse student body. We've got over, you know, nationally over 50% of our students are students of color. Our workforce is still of teachers is still over 80% white. Um, and then every context is unique Right? Um, and at the same time, we've got incredibly rapid dynamic change when we think about the th kinds of things that are going on right now, right? Like things I was referring to, COVID, for example. So educators can't do this alone, right? Um, so, you know, a lot of districts, they say, okay, we're going to identify experts to help us. Um, and so one of the things that I got really interested in is that there was a, um, Oh, I forgot to I forgot to talk about this. Um, I'll, I'll talk about this this uh, district in just a minute. But this is this is a kind of um, the dominant theory of change that really comes out of what you all were talking about, right? That uh, many of our traditional conventional practices of family engagement. What are they? Go ahead and just shout some out. What what is what does family engagement typically consist of in schools? Open house. PTA. PTA. Parent teacher conference. Parent meetings. Sending sending what? Send, get, getting the flyer and smashing it in the bottom of the backpack where mom might find it two weeks later. Exactly, right? Uh, One-way communication. So it's on the website or it's in the email. Uh -huh. Okay, so a lot of those things, which we, you know, like, and, and I, you know, like this is, uh, yeah, I consider myself, my, myself an educator too. Like I know, like these are things we got to do. Um, and for many families, those, the things that we think that have we been socialized to think are these important forms of family engagement often can lead to disengagement. Um, and they end up getting us this kind of dominant theory of change where a lot of the efforts then are focused on training parents to be helpers or beneficiaries of the school's agenda and the school's expectations. They assume schools are neutral spaces um, I, that's kind of one of my favorite things. People kind of think schools are magical and they're immune from all of the other dynamics that are outside of schools. Um, that, and they disregard these kind of profound racial um, and other power inequities that exist um, outside of schools. They also play out inside of schools. Um, and then a lot of those efforts end up, they are, they are um, in a subtle way often working to assimilate non-dominant families and communities to white middle-class norms, values, and behaviors. So we know that um, back to the district that I was mentioning earlier. So we, you know, a lot of districts will seek out different kinds of programs, 
to address this kind of thing. And then some districts are, are seeking out other experts. And, and one of the districts that um, I encountered um, was a district that realized they had a, they had a rapid influx of um, what today we would call um, uh, emergent bilingual students, Latino b emergent bilingual students. Um, and they realized that they were lacking some expertise. So this is a school board member who said, we weren't meeting the needs of our Latino and minority students. I think there was great fear by some teachers and administrators that they didn't know how to meet the needs. Um, so they sought out experts on uh, these children's culture, their community context, their native language, the individual uh, learning priorities and needs and interests, and that was their families. Um, so these, uh, this is a group of low-income immigrant Latino families who were part of an organizing group, um, and they ended up collaborating with educational leaders uh, in this district, and um, over time, developed a relationship um, that actually started to make changes for the experiences of these young people in schools. It wasn't perfect. It was always, there was always tension in there. But um, that was the kind of basis on which I started to say, okay, this is really different than the parent-teacher conferences and the PTA. What is it that's different? So one of the things that dif was different is that the focus was not on fixing parents or assimilating them to the school's uh, expectations, but on systemic change within a culture of collective responsibility. The parents in this case were treated as, as, as uh, fellow educational leaders who could help shape the agenda. They were part of shaping the uh, strategic, plan, strategic plan. They met regularly with the superintendent. They met regularly with school board members. Um, the strategies were really around building capacity and relationships. So they would develop relationships with teachers, with principals, with other district leaders. Um, and this is a really important part of that. Um, they also were addressing the broader context of what was happening in the, in the community. So this was a community that, um, that that rapid influx meant that there was a sort of long-standing white community that um, had what one of the um, one of my participants called demographic denial, um, meaning like they thought that they would eventually head off and not stay around. And so one of the things that was that I really started to attune to was we often are very focused within the four walls of the school in our conventional family engagement work. It's very individualistic. And these folks were really intentionally trying to address the broader community and the broader context. So they were working with um, business folks. They were working with the, um, the Chamber of Commerce. Um, they were working with the teachers union. Um, they were working with the local newspaper um, and actually trying to do a series. They did a series where the local newspaper kind of embedded with some of their efforts. So they were very intentional about addressing the kinds of changes that they were trying to have to see happening in classrooms and in the, in the district in the context of what was happening within the broader community. So I was like, OK, great. We've got this new model. We've got a different way. It looks really different. It hasn't fully realized that, but I can see a different model. And then I started sharing that with lots of districts. And they were like, but, but we're not there. We're here. How do we get from here to there? Um, and so that was one of, the, uh, one of the things that I really started to think about. How do, I, how do we kind of weave some key ideas together, given the vast differences across different communities? Um, and given that every context is unique, how do, we, how do we begin these processes? And so that's where these four principles came from. And that's why I use that kind of weave on the front there, because none of these kind of stands on its own. Um, but the idea is if we follow some of these different um, principles in whatever work it is that we're doing, it can begin to move us towards more equitable forms of collaboration. All right, and I, if you come tomorrow, I'm going to unpack more and more of those. But I want to, um, and you'll see them show up in the rest of this, but I want to kind of focus on the data piece of this because one of, one of the chapters is really focusing on how do we use data for um, equitable collaboration? And, you know, we have this uh, uh, kind of dominant paradigm around data that has been often weaponized against communities in particular, right? Uh, we know research has been done in that way, but also data and the forms of data that policy and um, accountability regimes are emphasizing. 
Um, and so we know that, and at the same time, as we think about making change, we also know that data is really important in schools, right? We always, we all, we're always having to look at data, we always have to think about data and how that might inform the, the work that we're doing. So with a number of different partners, we started to think about what would it look like if we reclaimed that relationship to data? And instead of it being weaponized against communities or used in deficit-based kinds of ways to lay blame, um, what would happen if we changed how we thought about data, what, it, what counted as data, what mattered, who was working with it, and how we engaged in those kinds of practices? Ultimately, it is about an inquiry process. And so the easiest way for me to talk about this, and you'll see those principles that I flashed up there earlier, um, is through some examples. So I'm going to share one example here um, um, about uh, a curriculum design team. And um, this is, on the surface, very simple. right? So it's like, in this district, they had, we had some prior work that we had done, and they identified that they wanted to build parent capacity. So it did come out of a kind of train the parents kind of approach. Um, but then we said to the, the district, well, you know, you say that parents are experts on their own children and their own priorities, needs, and interests, so maybe they should be the ones helping to co-create this program and the curriculum. And the district said, hmm, yeah, okay, I guess so. So we built relationships. And we said those relationships make a difference for young people, and they're going to make a difference as we create this curriculum. And it, it followed a very simple kind of cycle of starting with, the, with this idea of design and co-design. So let's try out some ideas. We'll come up with ideas. They grow out of people's stories and their experiences and their priorities and their dreams. Try things out, get feedback, and redesign. So one of the things that one form of um, data, oops, there we go. One of the things that distinguishes uh, the kind of co-design um, that I'm talking about, that this is an example of, is that it holds process and outcome as equally important. And this is really hard for folks to get a hold of um, because we have such an outcome-oriented um, system. The, often when I, when I introduce folks and a lot of my students to this idea, they swing the other way and they want it to be only process and only relationships. And part of what co-design says is, yeah, there's actually an object. There's a thing we're trying to do. There's change we're trying to make. And we're also trying to build relationships. We're trying to engage in a kind of relational um, uh, process that is going to shift the way that we interact. So this was the object. This is a thing that um, came out of that. There's a curriculum. There are these lessons that they identified um, and that we built together and we tried out. Um, and they shared their interests and priorities. And those were the basis of the, the principles that shape every one of the lessons. Um, and um, then we added in educators and then generated ideas and tried them out and redesigned. So one of, the, uh, district, one of the district leaders who I still end up working with now, um, she was like, man, I thought I was a data-driven leader. <laughs> She's like, that's nothing compared to this. This is the most data-driven process I've ever experienced, which was funny because I, I've had a very complicated relationship with the idea of data-driven anything because I don't think data drives anything. People do, right? Um, so this is kind of interesting reframe to me that, that got me kind of thinking, and which is where we kind of came up with the idea of solidarity-driven co-design. But data is still really important in that process. So I'm going to um, invite you to, to take part in um, a, a, a practice that we do around transcript data as a form of mirror material. And this is from Engstrom's theory. And I'll, I'll get into some of the wonky theory in a little bit here. But I want to kind of start us with the experience. So um, we're going to um, read this aloud, and I'm, uh, I'm going to give you the context for this. So this was, you know, you saw that nice little uh, circular diagram. So we started, uh, and the family shared their experiences. Many of them were, were very, you know, like actually one of the quotes from the beginning was actually from one of those parents. They were challenging. They had hard experiences. They uh, had, um, had issues that didn't get resolved. Um, and so then they, they shared those experiences, and then we said, okay, so 
you get to design this thing. Um, what are your priorities? What do you want to know? What do you wish you knew? What do you know that you want to share? What are, what are these priorities and things that you want to do? So they picked these priorities. One of them was about addressing bullying and especially the dynamics of, of racialized bullying um, that they were experiencing in their school. Um, so the first person, oh, so that was just the families, and then the educators came. So the teachers and the principals joined, and we did that intentionally because we wanted to begin with families and communities, right? There's a power dynamic there. And the, um, so when the uh, teachers and principals came in, the families got themselves organized, and they said, we're going to present to the educators what are our priorities. And we made it really clear from the beginning to the educators that this is because it's a parent curriculum, their priorities are going to shape this, but you know we want the educators to be part of it. They need to be part of the process as well. So this is the first meeting when they came together. Ben, in this case, is, is a Vietnamese parent, um, and then he, they, the parents were like, "You be the first one to kind of present these." So he's presenting the first one that's about bullying, um, and then Miss Mullen is one of the principals in there. So we're going to read this aloud. I'm going to ask one of you to be Ben and one of you to be Ms. Mullen, the principal. And as you're reading, I, I want you to just be paying attention to multiple things here. This is the complexity, right? So I want you to pay attention to um, the, the, the what. What are they talking about? What are the ideas or the concepts? And then I want you to be paying attention to what's happening between the people. What are the interactions, OK? The, only, the other thing that I will say is this was a very tense moment. There was a lot of pauses. The transcript doesn't necessarily reflect. There were a lot of pauses and silent space in this. OK, so can I ask somebody to, um, is the microphone OK? Great. Can I ask one person to be Bin, and then somebody maybe not too far away <laughs> from that person to be Ms. Mullen? Oh, great. Awesome. These, these two are, are going to. OK, I'm going to be Bin, the parent. So we picked up this topic, which is bullying, you know. Myself didn't have positive um, feedback. What we would like to hear is some kind of announcement from the school or the teachers when people are reporting a <laughs> violation. For me, it was up in the air. I don't know what's going on, but the thing seemed to be resolved by itself without me knowing. And what I'd like to have is some kind of collaboration response regarding the issue. But that was my hope. Can I just clarify, Ben, are you speaking for you specifically or are you speaking for all the parents right now? For myself and also from hearing from other parents as well. So it's a recap of the conversation you guys had. Right. So now turn to a neighbor, discuss. Thank you for the reading. What do you notice about what they're saying and their relationship? So I'll just cue you up so that we can get the microphone moving in the right place. So I'm going to invite you to share some of what you noticed um, when you were looking and thinking about this transcript. I have no idea where the microphone went. So. OK. Very dismissive. Oh, there we go. Do you want to, do you want to add anything to that? It feels as if the principal is trying to assign value to this. Is this important to me, even though this person maybe was elected by the, the parent organization to speak on their behalf? It seems like the principal is immediately trying to see how big, I'm using air quotes for those of you online who can't see me, how big or how important of an issue this might be to her. Hmm. OK, so then maybe there's some assessment going on there. Anyone else? OK. Oh, great. 
So we have a couple uh, from Kevin Smith, who's um, a graduate student at UH. I'm intrigued by the mirror material. It seems as if Ben is requesting information that may be protected by FERPA. How would a public school reconcile keeping parents informed, preventing the spread of community um, hysteria and protect the student's right to privacy? Um, and then Samantha Collins, another one of our uh, graduate students at UH, says the dynamic does seem po does not seem positive, almost as if Miss Mullen is challenging Ben instead of inviting and encouraging um, her feedback. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? It felt more about the justifying the position of the parent than it did about the issue that they were bringing up. Interesting, okay. Yeah. I think um, as an administrator, um, I can see how the administrator <laughs> was definitely, um, she, she put up a wall, right? It was more like self-defense. Um, you know, I guess schools usually sometimes are targeted and the parent is here. I think he needs some affirma affirmation um, and Paraphrasing, you know, as simple as that. We need to really paraphrase what the parent is conveying. And many times, you know, you put up your guard as in like, you're you're judging me or am I not doing my job right? And so it's important to have those conversations and to have somebody else mediate those conversations. You can learn from those things. So interesting. Okay. Oh, we'll come back to you. Thank you. Um, it just felt like she was trying to intimidate him. Um, and like she was because um, she was she quickly kind of like challenged him and was like you know I'm like kind of like who are like who are you like to come you know um, and who's backing you up kind of like challenging him to mm -hmm. to see if he was gonna back down or you know just quiet down and yeah. in the back row here um, first I would like to say <laughs> This parent came to talk about bullying. The principal bullied the parent. <laughs> There's no other way to put it. And we, know, we all know some of these things. As an immigrant, you know, most times you want to feel sorry for yourself and say, oh, they wouldn't treat the white lady like that if she was the one here. You know, and at times these things are true, you know. So just like Fatima, the Somali ladies um, talking about being judged, being disrespected, demeaned, and all that, we can tell from this interaction. You know, I always tell people, being a teacher or being an admin in the school, you're just like customer service. You're, you're in charge of people's kids. There's no way. When she said, can I just clarify being? That was belittling. You know, she came outright disrespectful. That, that's what I noticed. Anyone else? Yes. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. Again, um, as I was talking with Jaime here, my first thought was that the principal is really trying to narrow this into maybe what she already believes is the issue rather than trying to excavate more and to open it up and to learn more about what they mean. It seemed like she was really trying to get at, so I think this is what you mean. And mirroring can be a very... Um, powerful tactic in lots of ways, but in this case, I don't know that she got it right and her misinterpretation narrowed rather than expanding. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so actually just, just to clarify, so then the idea of mirror material is the transcript is a mirror about the interaction that was happening. So we actually brought this back. We brought different parts of the conversation when they were negotiating, like sort of priorities, were sharing priorities, and then the kind of conversation where they were negotiating them. And what was interesting was that um, we took the same, that was actually earlier in this transcript, and then the parents kept referring back to this moment over and over again. We we're like, oh, I, I knew that there was something going on because I was like, oh, crap, <laughs> when this happened. Um, <clears throat> I mean, and then we started to look at it much more closely, and we say, oh, well, that's really interesting. She's saying, are you speaking for yourself, by yourself, only you, by yourself, or are you speaking for absolutely every parent, right? It's kind of binary, right? Well, what is he supposed to say? When he says, well, I'm both, kind of both. I'm speaking for both. And so when, when we, this, the, and this is not an easy thing. We take this data and we bring it back to the people who were in the conversation. So by chance, we, we knew that we needed to have a, a different conversation with the families than with the educators at the time. By chance, 
the principals weren't available at the time that the teachers were. So we ended up having, just by chance, three different groups. We had families to take a look at it. We had um, teachers take a look at it. And then we had the principals take a look at it and the district leaders. So the principals, especially the one who was in here, said, well, I was just trying to be, I was just trying to clarify. It just, you know, that's all. It just, like, it was just a, a moment to try to be clear about what's going on because there's all this talk that's always happening and it's not always bullying, you know, so we just, we need to be clear about what's actually happening. That's all I was trying to do is just clarification. The teacher said, hmm, there's kind of a power dynamic there, isn't there? And what do you think the family said? What's that? Yeah. So the family said, so there was actually, um, and this is, this is an African-American mom who, um, was, who actually wasn't there that time. So we were reading it together, and she throws the transcript down on the table. And she said, this is what I'm talking about. This is what I'm talking about. So it was a really, it was a really powerful moment, because then the parents all said, kind of said, this is not just my individual experience. This is not just about me, that I don't understand how I'm supposed to talk to the school or how I don't understand how I'm supposed to navigate in the system or I don't speak English or X, Y, Z. This is a systemic issue. So that is one of the things that, that was really powerful. Over time, this is one of the things, is um, one of the principals, this is like two years later, she said, I was, she got me to the side and she said, I was really defensive. That was my cognitive dissonance about having to reckon with my own behavior. And she's like, I feel really weird about how I reacted to that. <laughs> yeah. I have a question. For her to come to that terms, you said after two years, right? Yeah. You must have done a lot of work with her. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't actually, I mean, part of it is that there were, there were, there were a couple of district leaders in the mix who were trying to sort of, because these are principals who said this is their, their professional learning goal, was to take it farther in terms of their ability to collaborate with families. So they chose to be part of this process. There were district leaders who were in the mix who were, who were kind of keeping an eye on them and, and touching base with them. But some of it, to be honest, I think, was this processing. It sometimes takes a long time for us to process these things. It's not easy. It's hard. And that's what this principal said when um, she ended up actually then sharing later. Yeah, she, I mean, she, she, she said, um, this is not for the faint of heart. This is not what she thought she was in for. This is not what she thought family engagement was. <laughs> All right, so, so these moment-to-moment -moment interactions reflect broader systemic dynamics, and they become opportunities when we put them on the table because tensions and contradictions are inevitable. And just like everybody else in that room, I was like, oh, no, we screwed up. You know, like I had this total um, oh, crap moment. And then to kind of remind myself, like, that is part of this process. They're inevitable because power is playing out in these spaces. And I got to remember that I'm not creating, even I can't create a magical space where those dynamics don't come back in, right? So those moments then become moments to intervene and to transform power in there, to reshape the kind of roles, the expectations, the interactions, the power that's playing out in there. And then might think about more broadly outside of this one piece of data, how we can collect data, use it, make sense of it, um, not to weaponize it, to blame people, but to be actually to humanize each other, to humanize young people, families, and communities, and to build a kind of collective transformative agency to make change. Um, and so that's a kind of invitation as we think about data and, and families, young people, and communities thinking about how we might go beyond giving voice to actually collaborating with families to use data to co-design the kind of education our young people deserve. I'm running a little shy on time, so I'm not going <clears> to <throat> go into so much detail on this last piece, but I do need to touch on it a little bit um, so you get a sense of um, where the more recent work has gone. And this is just a reminder of the, how each of these um, principles is showing up in this work. Um, Solidarity Driven Co-Design comes out of the Family Leadership Design Collaborative, which is a national network. Um, and we had a couple of different iterations of it, but we were pretty intentional about um, 
cutting across disciplines, cutting across roles. So there are scholars, family leaders, uh, community leaders, uh, educators, um, district leaders in the mix. And our first um, uh, phase, we had 10 sites across the country that were engaging in what we call um, a community design circles. So there are a series of at least three or more sessions where <clears throat> they were bringing together families and sometimes educators um, to really talk about those roots that you see there. What are some of the roots and the histories? Um, and then what are some of the current challenges and possibilities? And then what are those futures that we want to imagine? Um, and so this is the, this is the, um, the nerdy uh, um, theoretical part, uh, which I'm happy to share more with, other, with later if people are interested, but it's a kind of participatory design research. It comes out of the learning sciences. I am not a learning scientist. Uh, so this is something I learned in collaboration with other scholars. So I want to just give you an image of what a couple of those sites were so you could get, a, um, you know, kind of think about what, what these groups were up to. Um, if you come tomorrow, I'll actually dig into some of their practices. But this is a group in Los Angeles. They were really focused on black and brown parent solidarity and humanizing interactions between parents and teachers. Um, and they, they had passed um, a kind of discipline. They were working on the discipline and the, the school to prison pipeline. And so they had passed this sweeping reform in Los Angeles. And they were like, wait, our parents are saying, in the everyday interactions, they're still having the same thing. The, po the policy isn't doing very much. We're still having the same in, um, um, interactions. So they set out to say, what would happen if we actually really focused on that and tried to develop a kind of solidarity, especially between black and Latino parents, because they're often set at, at odds with each other, and then thought about those conversations as leadership moments for parents to lead educators in more humanizing interactions. So that was one series. How did you like, take care of the language? Like, brought, like, the, you know, were there any Spanish speakers who didn't speak English? How was that? Yeah, they, had, they, had, um, they did um, simultaneous translation, or interpretation, sorry. Yeah, they were, they were doing both. And that's actually one of the examples that they gave of the solidarities, is like if they went into a meeting and there wasn't um, any interpretation, the parents would refuse to do anything because they were like, we're not doing this until we get interpretation in the room. Another, um, and I'll talk, a, you know, yeah, anyway, there's, there's like huge stories with each one of these, but I'm just trying to give you a snapshot so you get excited. Um, so West Salt Lake City in Utah, um, they have these um, budget decision-making councils, right? And they're mandated to have parents on them. It's supposed to be this whole like statewide policy so that, that parents have a say. Well, of course, especially in West Salt Lake City, which is primarily immigrant families, they felt like they were, when they would come, they would just, the principal and the other educators would say, like, sign, sign here. It was like this rubber stamp dynamic. And they were like, that's, that's not decision making. Um, so they said, what would happen if we reimagined that? Let's reshape how that would work. And then let's, let's work together um, between families um, and uh, there's a CBO, uh, sorry, community-based organization, and then um, particular schools to try to um, do something different in that space. Um, and the third example I'll give you is in Chicago. So um, urban indigenous communities there were thinking about what does it mean to develop a kind of global indigeneity um, across different indigenous communities. Um, and so they really focused on creating intergenerational learning spaces because for any given school, there weren't a lot of kids in a particular school. So they were actually working, thinking expansively about um, learning spaces um, and they were working outside of the school district to create these intergenerational learning spaces. Um, so I'm not going to spend time going, I'm just going to skip through this. But one of the things that we did is we looked across all of these. So that, that, that was just three snapshots of three. There were actually 10. We recorded all of the conversations, we transcribed them, and we coded them because we wanted to understand what were their theories of change. So what were they, and this isn't what they actually did, this is just what they're talking about. What is it they want to see happen, and what do they think it will take? to get to that thing they want to see happen. So we coded them based on the kinds of things that they were talking about. 
And then, of course, predictably, we put them into families. <laughs> um, and so then we have four different families here. So we've got the, this family um, is, is about really improving parent capacity to educate children. So we still, even though all of our sites were, you know, like they were, they were um, um, excited to dig into these kinds of principles, that we still had um, sites that were talking about, um, you know, that we need parents to do things differently. They're, um, if they change um, their knowledge or their investment or their priorities, then things will change in schools. Uh, the second set, we well, they have the fewest of these. The second set here are within systems change making. So those were things that were about like, we need to get um, more representation um, on whatever decision making uh, group, or we need to have more inclusive spaces. Uh, we need to educate families and communities to um, understand about what it is that um, they should be entitled to. Um, this one here, Reclaiming Our Systems of Education, um, was really trying to think about, the, a lot of the organizing groups were kind of in this space. Um, how do we develop um, advocacy? How do we expand our notion of what matters and what counts? Um, and then how do we protect our children from uh, racialized harm? This last one up here is what we call solidarity dream and justice making. Um, and so that was really thinking beyond our current system, beyond even reclaiming our current system, but what does it mean to do things like um, heal, to humanize our relationships, to consider other people in our schools or our communities as extended kin or relatives. So this gives you a sense across the 10 what the relative percentages was, were, as I said, the, um, the improving parent capacity was the, was the smallest. But you can see, partly, we suspect, because of the principles that we shared, these two dominated. And I want to um, invite you to um, just take a look at this and see, what do you notice about this one? D, sorry, DC stands for design circle. So this is over time. They were, they were uh, some of them were like, as fa the, the, the one that was the tightest turnaround was doing it one week after the next. But most of them are more like once a month. Proportions, like the things that are most important tend to be most important over time. So the solidarity dream and the justice making is accepting what you see in line. But mostly that seems to be the predominant mm -hmm. followed by mm -hmm. OK. So these, these persist as very sort of predominant relative proportion-wise to the others. Anything else? Yeah. Improving parenting is going away. Uh, so small. Getting small. <laughs> yeah. Well, What's getting bigger? What's taking it up? Yeah. Interesting, huh? So we call this the, the, the uh, well, it doesn't look very blue. It looks green. The green-purple shift. So one of the things that we notice is over time in incredibly different contexts. I mean, we're talking like rural New England, the Mississippi Delta, urban Chicago, Los Angeles, Seattle. Um, over time, these kinds of theories of change are deepening. The blue, or sorry, green and purple. Um, and so one of the one of the big takeaways from us, and it sort of seems obvious. But, but actually, we have empirical way to demonstrate it now, is that most of our family engagement activities are one-offs. That is our thing. We do one-offs, right? Even if we do like a less listening session, it's a one-off. But when we actually dig in with folks and we enable them to build relationships and to deepen their conversation, something shifts about the kinds of solutions they start to imagine. So that was a really powerful takeaway for us, um, and that has really shaped subsequent work. I'm going to um, just queue up a couple of, there's lots of resources online if you're interested in finding out more. There's still the Family Leadership Design Collaborative has a whole website um, that you could go to to find um, resources. And um, I would love to use the rest of the time to do some Q&A. So questions, does anyone have any questions for Dr. Ishimaru? Again? Oh, you give me the mic once and it never goes away. Now I have a question about your assumptions. Before you dove into all of this work, what assumptions did you go in with and, and how were you surprised, if surprised at all? What were you surprised by? 
In terms of the um, the design circles or those or the whole that all of and just overall throughout all of this this whole journey, um, was there any assumption you had that was really thwarted or that was really um, uh, you realized yeah that was right all along? Was there anything that really stuck out to you? Um, well, one was the one that I started with. I had some inkling that we weren't getting the full story in terms of the, the voices and experiences of especially marginalized families. Um, and so that actually, like, I, I had that feeling, but I couldn't point, I couldn't really point to very much. And so this, this was, um, these experiences and the research were um, an opportunity to, like, actually see that play out in research. It wasn't just an inkling anymore. So that, so that was one thing. Um, I think one of the other things I was surprised by what I, I just thought these are like with this last that last piece with the theories of change. I was like these. There's such different contexts. You know, part of me wanted to be like, this is so different. We're not going to find any. You know, the, it, it just going to. You know, we we should be able to tell a story about how difference unfolds in different communities. And so that that one was a little surprising to me to be like, oh wow, look at that. When we, I mean, you know, it was so much like this this time. You know, minuscule coding of all these transcripts and all that kind of stuff. And then to see a pattern kind of pop out like that was frankly a little surprising. Okay, we have some one a question from online. Um, two actually, okay. Um, I, I'm white, not me, I'm the, I am though, but it's not the, you know, it's, the, it's the person that I'm talking about, you know what I'm saying, okay. I'm white and fourth generation American. Earlier tonight, you described equitable collaboration as a new and better kind of engagement than traditional or old school kinds of family engagement that often leads to disengagement for persistently marginalized families. The way you describe relationship-centered equitable collaboration makes me wonder if it is actually new or if it's natural in, in our DNA and in the dominant culture, we are so removed from our ancestral knowledges that our solidarity and collaboration muscles are atrophied. The dominant culture is colonized and has traded its ancestral knowledges for white privileges. Is equitable collaboration new or is family engagement fake, theatrical, and colonized? What are your ideas around this? <laughs> Wow. <laughs> yes. They're gonna write they're gonna write the next book. Yeah. That um whew, yeah. That is why we have this graphic actually up here, right? So is the idea is that we're we're um we're not doing anything new. That's right. Um, that there are ancestral knowledges there and, and that that what happens in schools is actually the thing that's artificial, that's colonized. Yeah. yeah. All right, we have another question here. As campus and district leaders, what is the first step we should take toward family equity in public schooling? The first step. Well, I think that, you know, I'll talk about this tomorrow too. The first step is actually to think about what is it that we're already doing? So one is to become aware, to notice that we are operating off of a whole bunch of scripts and that there are these artificial things that are playing out. And we often, because of the, you know, like we're socialized in this, whether we're educators or we were students or we're community members or there were families, into thinking this is just the way it is. And of course, those of you who've gone to school in other countries or in other places realize there are different ways that it happens. Um, but I think that that's one of the things, though, is to just become, um, be, begin to notice, I think, how dominant the kinds of scripts are in terms of how we're playing, we're playing out our interactions about, you know, this is what the principal does, this is what the teacher does, this is what the district leader does, all of those kinds of things. And realizing that they're not, they're, they're racialized because they're coming out of these histories that we have. Um, I think the other thing though is just to say, what is it that I'm already doing? So that's one of the things that I always challenge my students when they're like, oh, okay, now I'm gonna go to co-design. And then they're like, okay, and well, I'm gonna pile it on top of all these other things that I'm doing. And what I wanna, um, encourage folks to do and invite them to do is think, wait, wait, what are you already doing that you can shift 
gears on. So everyone's doing something. I mean, you show up at work every day, right? We're, we're making decisions. Uh, we're interacting with people. We're having to decide what to do about different things. So what are the decisions that you make every day? What are the interactions that you have every day? Uh, Derek Lopez, who is a, um, su he was superintendent at the time we did, he did one of the sites. He says like, you know, how do we in, in our even, even our just like moment to moment interactions, the first in the morning, how do we shift from positionship, is what he says, positionship to relationship? Um, and to, yes, there's going to be the parent who's all worked up and, and, and upset about something, but how do you listen to what they're saying underneath what's going on? They're saying they're upset because they love their kid and they want what's best for them. And so do we. So really kind of focusing on what are the micro moves that are, that are like often right in front of us. And yes, we also want to address these broader systemic issues, but we're not going to wait to actually do those things. to us, you know, I'm hoping we have um, administrators here or future administrators because it will make the world a better place, you know, because for me, if, if I should answer that question, I'm just going to say everybody needs to learn to be kind. Do unto others what you want others to do unto you, period. The whole pedagogy, the first time I came across the word pedagogy, I was like, they are teaching us to just be good to students, to be, you know, and it's sad that we have to be taught that because some of us really need to learn it, you know. And in customer, I did customer service for a lot of years before I became a teacher. And one thing I learned is that you might not solve my problem, but you make me feel good. Mm -hmm. Don't make me feel worse than the problem I'm having, you know. So I, I hope so for every one of us. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Ishimaru, thank you for being here for sure. Um, one of the most profound things uh, when we studied your book in class, just schools, was uh, like some of the emphasis that you made on like the power of language. And you didn't really get a chance to like touch on that too much today. Um, but I feel like that's something that's super important that the folks should hear about. And uh, you you kind of like coined a term for me at least, uh, non-dominant families. So I guess my my question is, uh, can you kind of go into a little bit like what you mean by non-dominant families, how you kind of came up with that and like really your your own personal take on the, the power of language and, and why it's so important. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I didn't come up with non-dominant. That was, that, that's other scholars, but thank you. Um, <laughs> um, man, language is hard, isn't it? Because it, it carries meaning too. And so, um, you know, non-dominant meaning relative to really thinking about um, power. Right, so power is really central to that, and so thinking about um, who has been, who has power historically and currently, um, and who has been systematically uh, marginalized or or not able to um, activate their power, you, you know, this, the the language is evolving all the time. So that's one thing to say is like you have to actually put it in a book, and then the language evolves from there. But I think, but that, I think it's that is important because that's how we like we're actually like we're growing as we're thinking about that, rather than getting all caught up in like, well, that's not what I used to call it, and or that's not what you know, like I, I don't want to call you that or whatever. <laughs> um, but really, just thinking about like these are opportunities to like expand the way that we think about things. Um, like I've actually been using that term some, and com some folks in communities hate it. They hate the term. <laughs> so I, I've actually been backing off on it a little bit um, because they're like, we're not powerless. Don't, don't call us power, you know, like don't imply that we're powerless. And I'm like, okay, that's, that's fair, right? Um, so, the, you know, those are, those are some of the things that um, I think are evolving across time. And so I, I'm, I'm fine with like, this is, this is where the language is right now. It holds these kinds of meanings that are important because not all families have the same power in our systems. And I think it's really important for us to just be explicit and name that. And it may evolve. It may continue to evolve. And I'm, I'm here for that journey. Okay, we have someone else online, uh, Ruth Stevens, who says, in your research, which best practices or micro moves did you find were helpful for schools to make an impactful change as they attempt to build better com uh, collaboration? Yes, there are administrators in the room, and we too want what is best for kids. Uh, yeah, I was going to speak to that. Thank you. Um, I actually teach leaders. 
that's who I focus on. Um, uh, uh, aspiring principals and aspiring district leaders and systems focused leaders. Um, so I think, the, so there's, you know, like the complexity of all this, of course, is there's no one thing, right? We all know that. There's no, there's no take it off the shelf and implement it and it's gonna work for everybody. Um, but, you know, I think the, the, the there, there are some micro moves that, uh, that sound, um, what's the word I want? They, they sound, I don't know, um, like not just unconventional, they sound, some, they fly in the face of what so many of us are socialized to think of as what the leader does. So there are things like having a meeting, doing it in whatever the language is of the families. Um, so if I only speak English, then I'm the one who needs the interpreter. <laughs> not the families, we're gonna do it in Spanish or Somali or Vietnamese or whatever it is. Um, we're gonna have a space and I'm not gonna make you come to me. I'm gonna go to you wherever you are. So maybe that means it's in a church or a mosque or a cafe or a community center or um, an after school program. Um, and I'm not gonna set an agenda. Which like the first time I tell some of my aspiring <laughs> principals, they're like, what? <laughs> No way, I can't do that. Like that's the definition, right, of what we're supposed to do. No, I'm like, no, don't set an agenda. Go in there, ask them what their experiences is, what their experiences are. What are the issues? What do they care about? What do they want to know? What are they, what are their dreams? What are their hopes and dreams for their children? We start there and you listen. And you don't try to solve it. That's the other thing. Some of my, some of my folks, we, we do this transcript read, and I had one of my folks who was a principal. He's like, oh, my God, I thought I was being helpful. But every single exchange with a parent who tells them something, he tries to solve it for them. And, and I was like, why are you trying to solve all the problems? Just listen to them, right? And guess what? They can begin to solve those with you. <laughs> So a lot of those things are these sort of like, like they're micro moves that seem like they fly in the face of what it means to be a good leader. But they actually open the space and reshift the way that power plays out. Um, we have someone else online who says, what are your thoughts on how we can sustain and scale up successful parent engagement efforts? Scaling is a complicated conversation. So scaling is based, premised on a, a notion that we're gonna figure something out and then we're gonna replicate it over and over and we're gonna do that everywhere and then we'll have uh, consistent outcomes. So there are, there are like some of the continuous improvement models are kind of based on that and variability is a problem, right? That's a problem you're trying to solve. In solidarity driven co-design, it's based on this notion, a broader notion, not of like a factory that we're gonna like get this all right, but variability is not only just inherent everywhere, it's actually a resource. And so our goal is not to try to make everything the same, but there, there might be some approaches or practices that we can begin to take, like some of the ones that I described, that, that can begin to then help us think about how do we collaborate, that's why the collaboration is key, because I don't know, you know, like some of my students are like, just tell me, just tell me what I need to do. I'm like, I don't know. The, the folks who are the experts are in your school. They're in your building. They're in your district. They're, you know, like next door. Those are the experts. And what is going to work best for them in that context isn't going to be the same as what's going to happen, you know, in another state or another community. The only way you're going to know that is if you talk to them and you work with them and you collaborate with them. So th that's, you know, we like a lot of the folks in who are doing participatory design are not trying to sort of replicate this thing all over the place, but they're trying to build processes and folks, educators' capacity to engage in these kind of processes, and then they ripple out. So, I mean, for example, that curriculum that we developed, it didn't end up being, you know, they, they ended up doing it for a little while, and then the curriculum itself kind of fell to the side because they got whatever, they, they didn't have funding for a family engagement director, you know, so it kind of fell to the side. What we're paying attention to though is, 
did that, did that ripple out? So the folks who were involved in that, now one of the district leaders went to another district and she started doing that process over there. They started doing all this stuff with, with data and with co-design. Um, one of the parents decided she's gonna start a, a stay-at-home mom for, for Latina moms, a group at the school. Another one decided she's gonna go back to school and she became an instructional aide at the school that, um, you know, that, she, that was part of the co-design. Um, another one decided she was done with, pub, with the, the, the traditional public school, and she went out and started advocating for charter schools. So, you know, whatever you think about all of those kinds of things, though, one of the things that we did see is it developed the leadership of those folks, and they began to ripple that out. So that's when I think about this kind of this notion of scaling, it's more about how do we develop ideally the collective capacity and the kind of transformative agency. And if it doesn't, if we're not able to sustain, to sustain the collective of that particular group of individuals, what happens when they go out and then they c cultivate those practices? So we have Jackie from Minnesota who, uh, she's, she's zooming in from Minnesota. She wanted to be here at the conference tomorrow too. Um, she says, that's good news. The experts are the families and they will tell you what they need to do together with you. Um, and then someone else says, I agree. I've begun to seek out my ancestral wisdoms. It's helped me greatly to connect with myself, my parents, and my children. Yeah, related to that, there's another comment. Um, okay. Yeah, about going back to roots. Yeah, uh, I do feel, another person says, I do feel that a journey back to our roots prior to colonization will make us closer to our humanity and with the world we inhabit. Mm. Yeah, I think if there's, if there's sort of a, a thread that I'm hearing across there is this, this idea that like, and I'll talk about this tomorrow, we have a practice, or a, it comes out of organizing this thing called the river of life. And really trying to think about where do we come from? What are our histories? What is our present? And then how do we think about our future and co-creating the kind of futures we want to see? It's not to sort of pretend that these, the, 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 you know, histories of oppression um, and all of those kinds of things didn't happen, but that we are, um, there are, there's still knowledge, there's still practices, there's still wisdom, there's still stories, there's still joy that has, has existed all along and we can kind of like get so um, narrowly focused on the sort of artificiality of what happens in schools and sort of fighting, fighting, fighting that we can forget that we actually, we have those collectively um, as, as sort of intellectual, cultural and other resources to build forward from. So like the Chicago indigenous um, group, one of the things they ended up talking about was what does it mean to bend the river and to raise good elders. That became the kind of theme um, of their collective work, which kind of gives me shivers when you think about the, all the children in our schools right now, we're raising them and we want them to be good elders. We're raising them to be good elders. Yeah. Okay, before we, I do the last comment online, does anyone in the room have any other comment or question they'd like to ask? Okay, you're gonna make me run. Okay, hold on. <laughs> Hi, I do have one um, question is that through these um, design groups that you have with all the parents, um, how were the students or the kids from these parents that were in these uh, design groups, how have they changed um, through this process? as their parents has changed through yeah. this process? That's a great question. So we, we haven't really looked at that very much. There's, um, you know, there, there are studies that exist around like the kids of, of, of parents and families who are involved in community organizing and the kind of what changes it, it, um, it has for those young people. That's the, that's the kind of next edge of this work, frankly, is really thinking about um, how do we develop intergenerational um, co-design um, some of that already exists in, in some of these places. Um, and, you know, like as adults, that gets, that gets hard for us. Like I've never actually tried to co-design with my own kids. Um, and so then we have to start talking about adultism and, and how, do we, how do we navigate the, these complexities because as adults, and I'm just going to own this, you know, like I, I feel like I, you know, know stuff that I, <laughs> I want my kids to know or to do, right? Um, and so, and there's for 100%, you know, power dynamics in there. So um, I think that, that that is a really important um, 
kind of next next iteration of some of this work is not only like how do those young people experience it, but how are they part of co-designing these solutions? So I'm actually the the um, I have I always have sort of like um, different projects going on as as Dr. Freeland mentioned, and so one of them is a, um, a partnership. It's a research community practice partnership with Seattle Public Schools, and we're partnering with the Office of African American Male Achievement on um, early critical literacies. So we're talking first, second, third grade um, black boys. So both, Af uh, both uh, multi-generational descendants of, of those who were enslaved and also immigrant um, black boys. Um, and um, one of the things, you know, the original plan was to co-design with the families, but then the, the kids started just coming to the different sessions. So now I'm thinking, I don't know, like I don't know how to co-design with a first grader. <laughs> Well, like, but we're going to learn. Then that's part of the process is like every time we do this, it's different. And I learned something new. So that for me, it really feeds me um, because, man, turns out those guys are brilliant, some of these little ones. So how do we, and then, you know, but there's still, there's complicated because their parents are there too, right? So how do, how do we kind of navigate some of those things and begin to have, because the, the young people, they're the ones who are doing the learning. They're the one, they're more directly, right? And I think I'll just, oh, and I probably had some assumptions that we could really, we really only do this with like sort of teenagers, you know, like older kids. So this is this is a good challenge to me. Like, okay, we're going to be co-designing with first and second graders now. So. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, so um, just we're gonna last few uh, thoughts here. Uh, what are your thoughts on how schools and teachers work with com work with community organizations to support parent engagement? On how? What are your thoughts on how schools and teachers can work with community organizations? How they can work with them to support family uh, parent engagement. Yeah, community-based organizations play an incredibly important role. Um, and that I, you know, like I'm just gonna own, like that was one of the things that I, I don't think we did right with the curriculum um, project, uh, the parent curriculum project, because we didn't bring a community-based organization along. So the, when we finished and there were, you know, whatever different issues would arise, the parents would come to us and, and be like, you know, we need to do this, we need to do that, we need to go to the board meeting, you know, like, which is great, but it was also like, oh my gosh, we should have brought a community-based organization along with us in this process. So then I kept trying to connect them to different community-based organizations who were like, you know, that's not what we do. We don't do X, whatever, whatever the parents brought up, right? Um, and so I think that that, uh, that again, is, is, is really crucial. Um, and I think it's really important to get out of the mode of, um, we, we have these sort of instrumental relationships in schools with community-based organizations. It's like, it, it's the same, that same dynamic where I was saying like, um, families are set up and they're supposed to just support the goals of the schools. Well, we've got a whole dynamic where we've got community-based organizations, after-school organizations, you know, social services. It's all about like, what are they gonna do to support the school? Um, and so trying to develop um, relationships that are actually about like, okay, so if you're doing, you know, you're developing um, black cultural identities with girls, like, like as a school leader, um, trying to figure out how do I support that and not be like, so what are their test scores <laughs> um, to demonstrate that I'm going to continue to partner with you, right? So because that create and that it's not just any individual um, leader, of course, there's a whole set of policies and funding and all that kind of stuff. Bianca Baldridge talks about that in her work that shapes those dynamics. But this, the community-based organizations provide a kind of external base um, outside of the school that can be that is really crucial for sustaining this kind of work because, um, and I'm experiencing this now, I think a lot of folks are, but there's all these budget crunches, people are leaving, there's turnover, all this kind of stuff, but you know who doesn't go away is the communities. They don't go away. 
All right, we have one comment and one last question. So the comment is from uh, Dr. Elizabeth Stackhouse, who says, this conversation all makes, also makes me reflect about our responsibility as higher, education, as higher educators and researchers to engage in projects and initiatives that intentionally support the needs of our existing families in our communities. And the last question is, would you please expand a little on your take of the use of data-driven things in education or others? I agree with you on data not driving something, but instead informing it, such as data-informed. Yeah, uh, so another one of my projects is called Measures That Matter. And it came out of the Family Leadership Design Collaborative. And so we've had all, we, we also had convenings and conversations about um, the problem is that we have very narrow forms of data, what counts as data. So we have a set of assumptions that data means numbers only. Um, it's quote unquote objective because it's numbers. And it, and it applies particularly to only certain kinds of things like standardized assessments, um, you, you know, like other, other kinds of very specific things, um, like attendance is an example, another example. Um, and so with only those narrow forms of data, we often don't know why something's happening. So I'll give you one, just a really quick example. One of the, the moms I'm, I work with um, got called in, you know, like there's this whole truancy conversation. Um, and, and they were like, your daughter hasn't been coming to school um, this is a real problem. You know, we're, there's going to be these truancy issues coming up. Look at the data, right? And so they were like having a very, um, the assumption was she was, this is an African-American mom, that she didn't, wasn't valuing education um, or she didn't care or she didn't notice, she didn't know better. There were a lot of assumptions in that. Well, and they didn't even give her an opportunity to tell what was going on. Well, it turns out her mother was dying. And she wanted her daughter to have time with her mother before she passed, right? And so when we only have the number of days that that little girl has been in school, we can make, and, and there's a racialized assumption, set of assumptions about what's going on there, we have a very partial set of information that we're operating from. And if somebody has sat down, and you could think of this as qualitative data, and said, hey, we've noticed that your kid hasn't been in school, is there anything going on that, you, you know, that, that you're, you're okay sharing with us? She would have told them like that what was going on. So there's qualitative data there too. But if we do a whole bunch of initiatives about like getting rid of chronic, you know, chronic absenteeism, all these kinds of things based on the data and the dashboards and the red lights and the, you know, the early warning signs, all kind of stuff. But we didn't stop to find out that Sharice's mother is dying and she wants her daughter to spend time with her grandmother before she passes, then we're missing a big part of the story. Thank you, Dr. Shimaro. Yeah. You. you know what, I, I got to tell you, one of the things that I, um, I really like, I really loved about your presentation is just your common sense, the, just the common sense-ness of what you spoke about. So thank you very much, very, very much. Um, I am going to ask you all to, um, before I pass the phone to my um, colleague, I am going to ask you to complete a survey, uh, or don't forget to complete a survey, uh, if I can find it. Um, I'll, I'll find it while she's talking, actually. So um, let's see. There you go. So if you want to snap that with your phone and take a quick survey about tonight's presentation, I'd like to pass the mic to Dr. Crystal Burnett Sanchez, who is uh, another one of the professors here at UHD who is instrumental in making and bringing Dr. Shimaro to us today and tomorrow. All right. Thank you. Thank, uh, thank you. Firstly, I want to thank, and I have to read off this because if you know me, I'm long-winded and I'm geeking out off all of this. So I'm a little like like this tonight. Um, but I do want to thank Dr. Um, Annie Shimaro for bringing this important information to us, the research behind, or the research that you've been a part of, and just the idea that's so very important of us centering marginalized voices and no long, and, and trying to break down these hierarchies that are separating people. Um, when when the, the 
the data that you showed of the different, the, it was like the bar graph and how what they were looking for, and I, I, you know, I took all my notes down here, but justice making and solidarity. At the end, that's all we really want. Like we're not asking for anything major, anything big, right? And so I don't see anyone who would not want that. And so if we're like breaking down these different barriers and coming together and different and, and serving each other, um, I, I'm fairly certain there are different backgrounds in here as far as like career and such, but somehow I think that everybody is connected to education, maybe perhaps, um, in, in, in taking this because it is so, it is so very powerful. Um, that idea of raising, uh, misquoting, but raising the elders, like, like, oh my gosh, we do think of the generations behind us, but to think of what we're doing right now can totally affect what's, what's going, what will happen in the next couple of decades. Um, the idea of, of the equitable collaborations and the humanization of all the people involved, um, that that service, the, the hot topics of service and, and, and being like, and, and, and servants and serving those who are, who we say like the parents, the families, the children are our clients. Let's behave ourselves in that way. Like we really do, do feel that. Um, something that came to mind was disruptions can be difficult. So when we heard the different comments from you all, and thank you for those who were able to participate in person and those who were also participating online for the different comments and how this can be very, um, it, it's very in here, it's, it's very deep and there's a lot that we have to unpack in order to do this work. But also in listening to the comments, both online and in, like, in this room, I was gonna say in this classroom, in this space, I think we can do it, right? Like even if we started as a small group, look at look at what was done with the with the I'm going to call it the center, but um, where you're starting the work in different parts, and just like a disease, like the pandemic spread, we can spread some goodness too. Um, so I think if we just ah, if we just like kind of empower each other um, and and help, don't don't forget what what should be our focus. Um, okay, I won't keep going, but. Um, I do want to, and I do need to read this off, but I, lastly, it was a group of individuals, you know, the, the, the Dr. Burks, myself, Dr. Ruth Lopez, Dr. Ruta Freelon, and Mr. Stephen Villano, um, who worked on a team together to, to bring these two events um, to you all. But there were also, oh no, <laughs> there were also organizations and groups. Um, we do want to, and this is very important, if you know the UH system, and sometimes we are, cause to be separate when we really do need, we need to work together, right, as a system. So I do want to acknowledge that it was UHD, it was UHD Center for Public Service and Community Research, our Department of Urban Ed, our college. Um, it was UH College of Education um, and the Educational Leadership and Policy Studies within the College of Education, two different entities, right, who came together to bring this um, to bring, to bring this to you. Um, and I do, you may not have seen much of Dr. Ruth Lopez, but she was over there monitoring the entire event online so that the voices of those who were in virtual space were able to participate in this event tonight. Um, so uh, I do wanna thank everybody uh, for coming. Thank you, there's probably still some pizza left. <laughs> it might be storming tonight, but have a, have a good evening. And again, thank you to Dr. Ishimaru.